Greetings, programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to World of Darkness Preludes Mage. And we are in day five of Julia's Awakening, guys, and things have gotten a bit hectic, to say the least. Gabriel sent us to a strange world where something I think really bad was about to happen to us, and we called in the cavalry in terms of Nizar and Mona, and there was a conflict between the mages. We also got to meet Ricky, who um, seems to be more technologically inclined than any of the other mages that we've seen, or more scientifically inclined, I guess. There's been a lot of speculation in the comments over what traditions these mages belong to, and I've really enjoyed reading them. I guess we'll have to find out. I'm going to go ahead and call my shot now. I'm going to say that Nizar and Mona are obviously Celestial Chorus. Um, I'm going to say that Gabriel... Uh, it's That's hard to determine because some people believe that he's a member of the Cult of Ecstasy, and some believe that he is a marauder. And then we also have Ricky, who some believe is a member of the Technocracy, which I found very interesting because um, from my little experience playing mage, the Technocracy were the big baddies to um, all mages. I know that may have evolved a bit as additions have continued, but I think it's easier to say that Ricky is maybe a member of the Virtual Adept um, tradition. I guess there's only one way to find out, though. We are in Day 5. You wake up when the doorbell rings. You have a massive headache. Holy shit. What the hell happened last night? Was it real? The rational part of your brain is screaming in protest, but the rest of you is pretty sure that what happened... actually happened. The lock rustles as Alex lets himself in. He sits down on the edge of the bed. Hey you, he says and kisses your forehead. He smells of cold air. I brought breakfast takes you a moment to realize it's your day off. Hop into the shower and I'll make coffee, Alex says. You stumble into the shower and turn the heat up until it's almost unbearable. The hot water clears your head some. When you come back out, the apartment smells of coffee and fresh bread. Did you hear? Alex says over breakfast. Chevaux. Um, Gesundheit, that word. Are having a meeting in Limham tomorrow at five. Jimmy Eckeson will be speaking. Limham, eh? Malmo's posh western district is the prime spot for them to be heard by the right people. The now mainstream Sweden Democrats have skyrocketed with the last few years, and the refugee crisis is fodder for their rhetoric. Man, that sounds familiar. <laughs> the right people. We should be there, Alex continues. We can't let them speak uninterrupted. You nod. Yeah. You consider telling Alex about yesterday's events. Listen, something weird happened yesterday. He think you're crazy. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and keep Alex in the dark. Not only because he'd probably think that we're crazy, but also because um, he seems to be the only human that we've been act interacting with lately. And I don't want to put him in danger. So let's go ahead and go with that. When Alex is left for work, your phone chirps. It's Nazar. The migration agency is putting us in a temporary shelter. Can you meet up tonight? Your place? Sure, you reply. Eight. You put the phone back upside down on the table. Mona and Nazar might have some answers. The atmosphere at Nordic Aid has been one of suppressed anxiety all day. You're not sure why. Perhaps it's because of the three screaming infants that just came in. Perhaps it's because there are more people than usual. Perhaps something trivial, like the fact that you've run out of black tea. You can't tell what starts the argument. At exactly five o'clock, a man punches another in the face. For a short moment, the whole place falls silent. The calm before the storm. Did that just happen? Get out of the way. This is going to be bad. Stop it before it happens. You might be able to calm them down. You know, let's go ahead and try some time magic here. Maybe we can prevent a bad situation by, from getting worse by stopping the bad situation altogether. You run into the storeroom and take out your phone. The watch says 1701. You rewind it to 1658. When you come outside, you spot the two men in the middle of the cafeteria and walk up to them. One of them, a short man in a blue windbreaker, is speaking into a phone while the taller one looks on, fidgeting. After a moment, the short man ends the call and drops the phone, and you catch it. The tall man lets out a short laugh and accepts the phone. He thumbs in a number and brightens, speaking rapidly in Arabic to someone at the other end. After just a moment, he hangs up and hands you the phone back. 
In English, he says, Thank you. My wife is okay. The atmosphere relaxes slightly. No fight breaks out today. So we Dracula'd the phone, and I guess kept it from breaking? Mona and Izar knock on your door at exactly 8 p.m. How is everything? you ask. Nizar shrugs. He has dark circles under his eyes. As well as it can be. We got registered at the Migration Agency. They gave us a couple of beds at a... halfway house? But they also told us we can't stay here. They want to take us north, Mona says. North where? I don't remember, but it's far. You've heard about this. They load refugees up in buses and drive them to distant northern towns that have room. Just last week, there was a story about a bus full of refugees that were driven out into a small forest town and who refused to get off. A lot of people like to say that it was because they were spoiled city people who turned their noses up at help. Others would say it was because no one had told them where they were going and why. When, you ask? Soon. Can't you just get out of it? You move your hands in a vague abracadabra motion. We'll see. There are forces working against us, Nizar says. Someone wants us out of here. Which is why it's important that we do this tonight, Moda continues. Do what? Teach you to see and speak. You sit down on the sofa. We know you can affect time, Mona says. We know you can also travel in your mind, otherwise you couldn't have done what you did. You're going to cast your mind back in time, Nizar says. But how? Mona smiles. You're going to help us tell the story. She and Nizar sit down on either side of you and take your hands. Mona begins to speak in soft, lilting Arabic. After a while, it strikes you that you understand what she's saying. Once upon a time, two siblings lived in a beautiful city. They were happy there, with a thriving family and work that they loved. They loved to walk the ancient streets at night to breathe in the smells of the city, both lovely and foul. Then the bombs fell. The family refused to leave. This was their home. They wouldn't buckle under the violence. It'll pass, they told each other. It'll pass. We'll endure. It didn't pass. Bombs fell, and fell, and fell. Relatives were killed. Friends were killed. The fragrant streets destroyed. The great souk ruined. Castles, schools, parks, gone. Food became scarce. Everything became scarce. Finally, what was left of the family decided it was time. They took what they could carry, sold what they could not, and left. The money got them as far as the Turkish beach. You go on, their mother and father said. Go find a future in Europe. And so they spent their last money on two seats in a small rubber boat. Is this where we rescue them? And suddenly you're there. Oh, and suddenly you're there, in a crammed little boat in the middle of the ocean. The water is choppy. Water splashes over your fingers where you're gripping to the side. Darkness is falling. You're cold. No one in the boat speaks. A baby is screaming, its mother desperately trying to soothe it. Mona and Nizar are in the middle of the boat, holding hands. Mona's headscarf has slipped back. She looks down at her feet and gasps. Water, she shouts. Water in the boat! And all you can do is watch as the boat takes in more and more water and then just gives way under the passengers. All you can do is watch as men and women struggle to stay afloat in the cold November water as a flailing arm hits Mona in the face and Nizar is pulled under by a panicked man. The seas take them one by one. No, this can't happen. Rewind, rewind, rewind. You run across the water, back to where they came from. There they are, Mona and Nizar standing on the beach. Two rubber boats are in the water. People are crawling into them. One of them, the one that the siblings are headed for, has the squalling infant. You grab Nizar's arm. Take the other boat. Nizar blinks at you. What? Ascending? Who are you? My name is Julia Anderson. I'm in Malmo, in Sweden. Come find me there. You're going to help me do this. But you need to take the other boat. Nizar notes slowly, or nods slowly. All right. 
Next to him, Mona is staring at you intently. Eventually, she nods too, and they get in line for the other boat. You watch as the boat disappears into the blackness. A baby's scream rings out. You can feel the couch under you. Nizar's and Mona's hands are warm against yours. You open your eyes, and you're back in your own living room. And so you did it, Mona says. The baby, you whisper. System crash. Good game. Hundreds of thousands of people are fleeing into Europe. They have nowhere else to go. They need to go somewhere. Over 100,000 people have requested asylum in the country just this year. Sweden has taken in more refugees, relative to its population, than any other country in Europe. The system was in bad shape before. It's even in even worse shape now. People who come here now will literally have to wait years to be granted asylum. They'll be sent by bus to remote areas where they'll have to wait in temporary housing with no access to help, jobs, education, not even an opportunity to learn Swedish so they can get on with their lives. But it's getting even worse than that now. I've seen it up close. People being herded into a stadium where they sit with no access to decent food or water, nothing to sleep on, nothing. That's what we're offering these people right now. The point is, the system is fucked. It's so fucked that those who come here have no hope of a decent life. So what do we do? Do we let more people in and let them rot in camps? Or do we clean our house up? Uh, do, 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 do. The answer is, none of the above. The answer is, we make our politicians get off their asses and start earning their keep. We make new policies. We make room. No matter what Sweden First tells you, Sweden's economy is better than it's been in years. We have the resources to offer all these people new lives. We have the economy. We have the manpower. Let's unfuck the system. Otherwise, we can't call ourselves human. Day 6, Tuesday. That was intense. The rain has let up. A platform stands in the middle of the square surrounded on all sides with a steel fence. It looks strangely small under the leaden sky. On the platform, two young men holding Swedish flags flank a microphone. Below the platform, a group of onlookers have gathered. Men, mostly, both young and middle-aged. The occasional couple. All of them are white and well-dressed. A line of police officers guard the fence. On the other side of the fence, the protesters. There are about 50 of them so far, staring silently at the platform. You see Ricky standing on the edge of the crowd, neither with the onlookers or the protesters. Next to her is a blonde middle-aged woman in a gray coat. She's speaking into Ricky's ear as she scans the crowd. The leader of the Sweden Democrats, Jimmy Ackeson, steps onto the platform. In his suit and glasses, he's the very image of a Swedish middle-aged class businessman. He looks confident relaxed. As he steps up to the microphone, the small crowd of supporters clap their hands. The protesters watch in silence. Why isn't anyone doing anything? What is he really saying? Hmm. Let's see what he's having to say first. You don't join the group of protesters. Just watch from a distance as they jeer and shout the platform. Dear Swedes! Axon begins. Silence falls. Dear Swedes, we have gathered here because we are worried. Worried for the state of our country. What's going to happen to us with the influx of refugees? Sweden has already taken in tens of thousands of refugees only within the last few weeks. Where are they going to go? How is our country going to cope with them all? He pauses. The answer is, we can't. The people know this. Our leaders know this, but no one will acknowledge it except the Sweden Democrats. And so he goes on, and you find yourself listening despite yourself. You know what it looks like at Nordic Aid. You've seen the cues to the migration agency. You've seen the pictures from the temporary camp in the football stadium. How the hell are you going to take care of them all? Can you really? The current policy doesn't work. It leads to chaos, but what's the alternative? The whole thing makes your stomach clench. You leave without watching the end. 
Ricky comes walking towards you in the street. The woman in gray walks next to her. Leaving, Ricky says. You nod. This is Magdalena, Ricky says. The woman in gray gives you a firm handshake. Up close, her eyes are a piercing blue in the dusk. Interesting, isn't it? What is? The whole situation. You look at Ricky. She really is a strange one. Hangs out in the hacker space and goes to the odd rave party, yet dresses like a businesswoman. And then her skills. And her views. And her companion, who more than anything looks like a CEO. You decide to ask them point blank. Are you with the Sweden Democrats? Ricky and Magdalena look exchange glasses or glances and Ricky cocks her head no but I think they are right to question the current policy we can't just open all the doors and windows and hope it'll be all right so we have a choice here between a green and not a green the thing about it is I'm going with the journal entry about I guess it was Julia writing it down about the problem and how it can be fixed just people need to get their heads on straight so, I don't agree. You take a long look at Ricky, at her smart outfit and fair Nordic features. The furthest you've emigrated was from Denmark to Sweden. You have no idea what these people have been through, you say. You don't understand what we'd be sending them back to. Ricky rolls her eyes. I know you like to think of yourself as aware and solidaric and whatnot, but seriously. Yes, these people are in need. No, we can't take care of them all. These people will be fine in other European countries, too. They're middle class. They're educated. They'll be okay. They're traumatized and lost all they own, you reply. Which is why they can gain back once they're in a country that has the capacity to take them in, Ricky says. But we do have the capacity. There are things that the media doesn't like to tell you, Magdalena interjects such as the fact that the system has already collapsed. So we rebuild it. Ricky sighs. I like you. Let's just agree to disagree for now. She pats your shoulder. Hey, I heard there's a rave happening soon. You wouldn't know anything about it. You shake your head, and Ricky nods. All right, let me know, yeah? Sure. You leave Ricky and Magdalena behind and find your bike. You can't get your head around how that woman thinks. There's a text from Ahmed on your phone. Tonight at 23, Beach Forest. Party. Neat. It happens in a little beach forest outside of town. It's cold, but people don't seem to mind. Breaths misting in the strobe light. A little makeshift bar out of a car. The music playing is light, bouncy, bird noises, brittle drums. Ahmed drove you here with Mona and Nizar. The atmosphere here tonight is strange. The siblings seem on edge. And then you see her. She's dancing in the middle of the crowd, and you see her clearly despite the darkness. Hair bright red against creamy, freckled skin, half naked and barefoot in the light drizzle. She turns around and looks right into your eyes, and it's like being caught in green headlights. Her gaze pushes at you like the midday sun. She smiles at you. And then she's in front of you. You have no sense of time passing. Who are you? Mona says next to you. I am called Merlinde, says the women, woman to her. And you are very welcome here. Merlinde looks at you again, and it makes your stomach flutter. Is this your protege? She's a friend, Nizar says. Merlinde nods. There are more of us here tonight. We have come from all over Scania. What for? Mona asks. We're needed here, she says simply. This region is hurting. Tonight, we dance and celebrate. Tomorrow, we begin the work. Melinda gestures at someone. A tall, dark man with a shaven head and a wild beard appears at her side. This is Steve. <laughs> Steve puts his hand over his heart and nods at the three of you. His cheeks dimple as he smiles. The music picks up, and the drums become more insistent. Let's, Stephen says. Your phone vibrates in your pocket. You take it out. It's from Ricky. The preview says, where are you? 
So we have a chance of opening the message and not opening the message. I oh, I forgot the name of it, but I think those are the na that's the nature-based tradition. And with her knowledge of technology, I figure if we open the message, that gives her a line to track us. So we're not going to open the message. You stuff the phone into your pocket. Ricky doesn't have to know where you are right now. You join the others in the crowd, and the music closes in around you like water. You don't notice them until they're right on top of you. It makes you marvel that you didn't see them before. Huge flashlights through the trees closing in on all sides. Dark shapes advancing. The music abruptly cuts off and is replaced by the loud shearing noise of something over your head. Drones. People fall silent in confusion. And then in a megaphone. This is the police. You are trespassing on a nature reserve. You will be loaded up into buses and taken back to town. Please comply. The police? Since when did the police use drones? You can see them more clearly now. They're dressed in riot gear, advancing through the trees like an army. While you're staring, someone grabs your arm from behind. It's a young policeman, big as a house. Come with me. His voice is very calm. Something is off. His grip radiates a chill that makes your arm go numb. The sound of people shouting around you diminishes. The policeman's eyes are a very light gray behind the visor. Come with me, he repeats, and you really want to. You let him lead you away, then it's like the nearby tree shrugs, and he stumbles onto a root that wasn't there before. Melinda yanks on your other arm. This way! She leads you toward what looks like a dark shadow in the line of cops. It's a shrubbery. What are we supposed to hide? Or what are we supposed to hide in there? You say. Trust me, Merlinde says. Fine, no way. Okay, sure. This worked out so well for us the last time we went into any kind of, you know, bushland. The shrubbery seems to be much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Tardis. Inside, Steve is crouching with Mona and Nizar. They look up as you enter. Shit, shit, shit. Steve mumbles. He's scratching something on the ground. Merlinde joins him. What are you doing? Mona asks. The suits are here. We're going to get those fuckers, Merlinde says. The suits? You ask dumbly. They're here for us, Steve says. Somehow they found out we were here. They're trying to stop us. Maybe even kill us. But what for? There's no time, Merlinde says. Listen, this is our place. Just do as we say and we'll be okay. You peek out of the shrubbery. The cops are leading the other partygoers away. As they leave, other people come striding through the trees. You can't see them clearly, only that they're not wearing the reflective vest of the police. Come here, Steve whispers. The thing he and Merlinde have scratched into the dirt is a large cross. It's glowing slightly with an eerie golden light. He points at one of the points of the cross. Sit there. The others position themselves at the other points and Steve pulls out a small knife. I have one better, Melinda whispers. She puts her hand between her legs. Her fingers come out bloody. She drives them into the soil. Ooh. She drives them into the soil in the center of the cross. Freya, she says. Wake your children up. Your enemies are here. At first, there's nothing. Then you feel a faint rumble in the ground and the sound of creaking wood. Let's get those fuckers. Berlinde says, and steps outside. You burst out of the shrubbery and into madness. The beech trees are swaying in an invisible wind. Icy cold gray is pelting down on you. The ground all around you trembles with roots bursting out of the ground. Despite the rain, a huge full moon shines down on through the branches. Four shapes in black are converging on a shrubbery. On the shrubbery. One of them is Ricky. Her face pale, locked in a stiff frown. She looks at you. It's like she doesn't recognize you. Give up, she says, and her voice is icy cold. Your little magic won't last. Fuck you, Melinda says and stomps her right foot on the ground. This is our turf. Roots radiate from her foot. One of them twines itself around Ricky's ankle and pulls her to the ground. Behind you, Mona and Nizar are chanting something in Arabic. A hot wind runs through the trees and your ears pop. You hear a scream and the sound of tearing metal. 
On the ground, Ricky raises something that looks like a taser. A loudspeaker sparks to life. Impossibly, grotesquely, it's a weather forecast. The temperature in Malmo is currently 9 degrees Celsius and expected to drop to as low as 6 during the night. It's overcast and we can expect heavy rains until tomorrow morning, says a dry male voice. Silence falls. It strikes you for a moment that this magic is a thing of the past, of stories, of myth. It doesn't have a place in the modern world. Mona looks at you. Her eyes are unbearably sad. She knows they have lost. Can we rewind? While you're staring, something grabs your arm. Oh! Okay. This is the same thing that we've seen before. Trust me, you say. Oh, okay. Trust me, Merlinde says. Wait, you say. Go. I have a plan. You don't really have a plan, but Merlinde nods at you and disappears into the shrubbery. You know what she'll be doing on the inside. Ricky comes striding through the trees. There you are, she says. Will you please come to your senses? Sure, you say. I'll come with you. Just let the others go. Ricky gives you a sad smile. You know I can't do that. These people are dangerous, so this is no doubt Then Ricky is technocracy. Dangerous how? We've been over this, she says. Tell me again, you say. No time, Ricky replies. The ground heaves and you both stumble. This is your chance. You're not strong, but you're fast, and Ricky is unprepared. You throw yourself at her and drive her to the ground. She lets out a short oof. It's all the time Merlinda needs. You hear her come out behind you. A hot wind runs through the trees. You hear the sound of screeching metal. The stench of ozone fills the air. Ricky drives a fist into your st stomach, but you headbutt her. Her teeth catch on your forehead, and you do it again. She moans and relaxes. A root twines itself around her throat. Something sticky is obscuring your vision. You wipe it away just in time to be blinded by an enormous flash. Then silence. Bright dots swim in front of your eyes. The little clearing is quiet. In the middle, Steve, Mona, Nizar, and Merlinde are on their knees. Around them, four shapes in black are slumped on the ground. Their bodies are smoking. Mona stumbles to her feet and runs over to where you're sitting. She helps you to your feet. Come on. You look down at... Oh. Whoa. Okay. So, something has changed here. Interesting. And we can actually see some of this. I think this is actually a good place to go ahead and end the episode, guys. Are we seeing stuff through Ricky's point of view now? I don't know, but this, this is awesome. Oh, time is not a measurement. It's a journey where the destination can always be changed. I didn't know we could click on these. Correspondence. Distance is an illusion. Space is a lie. A single step can take you anywhere. Mind. All minds are one. Outside time and space, everybody connects to everyone. And that's time, mind, correspondence. Wow. Okay. That's that's cool. I didn't notice I didn't know we could do that before. So I will go ahead and end it here, guys, and we will pick it up next time. Hope you all have enjoyed it. If you liked the episode, please leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, that'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.